Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before we begin, I'd like to kindly ask you to check your cell phones and make sure that they are either set on vibrate or silenced completely or turned off. Thank you. And I'd like to thank resident Tim Blodgett for suggesting to us that we invite Richard Higgins here to talk. I do my own cell phone. <laughs> Turn off my own. Yeah, that has happened once. Richard Higgins is a writer, editor, photographer, and lecturer. He was a staff reporter and editor for the Boston Globe for 20 years. And his writing has appeared in the New York Times, Atlantic Monthly, Christian Century, Esquire, and Smithsonian, and many other publications. He is the co-author of Portfolio Life from Wiley, and co-editor of Taking Faith Seriously, about religion in public life for Harvard University Press. As an editorial consultant, he has helped clients develop and write and publish books. Richard is a graduate of Holy Cross College, Columbia Journalism <coughs> School, and Harvard Divinity School. He and his wife, Reverend Jenny Rankin, live here in Concord, where they raised their three children. In the early 2000s, reading Thoreau's natural history essays and journal, reawakened and affirmed his own childhood love of trees. <coughs> He learned to walk where Thoreau walked, to love the same woods, and to see trees anew. He began to write about and photograph them. The result is this book and lecture, Thoreau and the Language of Trees. The book is a beautiful hardcover published by University of California Press with high quality black and white photos, which I'm sure we will see today. We have a handful of copies available for purchase after the lecture for $27 and that will be by cash or check only. I hope you'll help me welcome Richard Higgins. Thank you very much. I'm always aware when I get up to speak about Thoreau that I may not capture him in as few words or as well as a man who at an early meeting of the Thoreau Society uh, back when it was being held at the Colonial Inn in the 40s, said that, that um, Thoreau could get more out of an afternoon with a woodchuck than most men could get from a whole night with Cleopatra. <laughs> and I just love that. It has nothing to do with my talk, but I wanted to mention that. <clears throat> Thoreau was captivated by trees, and they played an important role in his creativity as a writer, his work as a naturalist, his philosophical thought, and even his inner life. He had an emotional bond to trees, but he also understood them as well as anyone in his day or since. When he wrote in the Maine woods that the poet loves the pine tree like his own shadow in the air, he was talking about himself. In short, he spoke their language. Now, what drew him to trees? Their beauty and form delighted his eye. Their wildness and perseverance uh, struck a chord in him. And he actually emulated their tenacious hold on earth by spending his whole life rooted here in Concord. Human nature looked somewhat bent to Thoreau, but trees were upright and virtuous. They spoke of the, quote, ancient rectitude and vigor of nature. Nothing, he said, stands up more free from blame than a pine tree. Now, old trees linked Thoreau to a realm of time not counted on the town clock, an endless moment of fable and possibility. They reminded him, he said, that he was a descendant of, quote, that heroic race of men of whom there is tradition, speaking about the ancient Greek philosophers and poets who meant so much to him. And trees were his teachers. Thoreau called the shedding of leaves in, in the fall a sylvan tragedy, but he knew that the fallen leaves would en enrich the soil and in time stoop to rise, as he put it, uh, in new trees. By falling so airily, so contentedly, they teach us how to die. Now, <clears throat> finally, trees expressed unfathomable mystery to Thoreau. 
He saw them as spires pointing beyond themselves, and the forest as a threshold to heaven. Come on. Oh, okay, fine, sure. If you would hand me my water. So I've just enumerated some of the ways Thoreau saw trees, and there actually are, are others. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, he was, uh, you know, a prescient preservation, preservationist uh, in his uh, study of forest ecology. Uh, but <clears throat> today I'm going to focus on his observation of trees personally, how he saw them both as a poet and a naturalist, and a little of what trees meant to him. And I have some of Thoreau's words and my own photographs to illustrate my points. Excuse me. Now, Thoreau often portrayed trees very imaginatively. A yellow birch was like a flaxen-haired maiden in a golden jacket of curling bark. An oak was like an athlete with well-developed muscles. Uh, white pines were like great harps upon which the wind played its music. But his writing about them uh, was firmly grounded in detailed observation in his extraordinary eye for trees. Now, Thoreau looked at trees every day on his rambles around Concord. Usually three to four hours, he said, were necessary to out in the woods to keep them sane. Observing their shape, color, texture, and stance, measuring, and even sketching them. And Thoreau was a, a marvelous artist. Uh, in his journal are, oh, easily three or four hundred of these sketches of various things, but maybe 40 or 50 of them of trees. And here we have some examples. Cheney's abel grows wholly southward and is in form just half a tree. And abel was a poplar. Uh, I mean, that was an, an archaic term for poplar. And down here, small white pines stand thus, the lower branches bent down to the ground, while the upper are free and erect. And as I alluded to a moment ago in his comment about pines, nothing stands up more free from blame. The erectness of the pine was a great symbol to him <clears throat> of its nobility. Now, about Thoreau's eye, it's true that he had the advantage of extraordinary eyesight. He writes in the main woods of being able to see a dragonfly a half mile off on Lobster Lake, which I mean is incredible. But a keen eye w w was not enough by itself to see trees the way Thoreau did. Uh, the eye, he said, cannot see alone any more than any orb of jelly. It took a desire to see what he called a separate intention of the eye. Quote, <clears throat> There is not a grain more of beauty in the landscape than we are prepared to see, he wrote in autumnal tints. The hunter enters the woods intent on seeing game, and so it is with him who shoots at beauty. He will not bag any if he does not already know its seasons and its haunts <clears throat> and the color of its wing, if he has not dreamed of it. When he has, however, he flushes it at every step. So Thoreau was intent on seeing trees, especially the details that separated one tree from another. Quote, a tree, stands, a tree seen against other trees is a mere dark mass, but against the sky it has parts, symmetry and expression. He wrote January 26, 1852. And I love that line so much, I almost called my book, Against the Sky a Tree Has Parts. The fine tops of the trees, he also wrote, <clears throat> so relieved against the sky, the fine tops of the trees are so relieved against the sky that I never cease to admire the minute subdivisions. By the way, these are almost all my photos. When they, they are not, I will tell you. And I hope some of you recognize some of these trees. They're almost all from Concord because I'm just trying to find beauty in the everyday trees that we see around us. These are near Esterbrook Woods. Um, 
And Thoreau was also fascinated by the uh, shapes and forms of trees, uh, which he believed expressed natural laws to them. Here is a classic, uh, really one of the last great pasture oaks left in Concord. It's a red oak at Hutchins Farm on Monument Street, a very beautiful tree that you can see from the road. Uh, this is a, another <clears throat> a classic tree. This is the Davis Elm. I have a whole chapter in my book about this. It's actually the son of, or from a cutting of uh, an elm whose demise, uh, who, the falling of which uh, occasioned this flood of uh, eulogy from Thoreau, uh, all about the Davis Elm that fell in 1856. And, and this, this is supposedly an elm from uh, a cutting of that very tree. So uh, the shapes and forms of trees. Uh, this is uh, in, off of Spencer Brook in Concord. This is a great tree. This is a catalpa in front of the Lincoln Public Library. That looks, you know, just, I don't know what it looks like, but uh, marvelous. Uh, and shapes and forms, you know, trees took really crazy forms too, like that one there. <coughs> now, and even, even the stance of trees, uh, you know, I'm having a hard time seeing my text because of the light here, forgive me. <clears throat> even the stance, how trees stood, revealed their character to him. Uh, here are some trees at, uh, at Buttrick's Mansion above the Old North Bridge. Uh, whoops. Okay. I love this photo. I think it's probably a great photo. It was taken by me entirely, 100% by accident. Uh, I was driving up to a place we go in southern New Hampshire along Interstate 93, and I looked out my left window, and I saw this, and I said, oh my god. And I just pulled over in the shoulder and took it with a point and shoot, and it just happens to be a great photo, but I love it. Um, again, back at um, <coughs> North Bridge. Forest, this is the Forest Hills Cemetery. Trees are a beautiful ornament to any, any cemetery. Um, now, Thoreau loved tall trees. Uh, towering white pines, majestic pasture oaks, and gra the graceful elms that enclosed Concord streets. And here we have an elm. This one is in Sakonet, Rhode Island. This is a great tree. <clears throat> I was just there yesterday because I took this photo in, I hesitate to say, 2005. And I've been visiting this guy ever since, and I call him Big Guy. And he's a very noble tree. Now, he's in his late years. Uh, he's, he's very advanced in age, and he has lost many of his leaders. But look with what dignity he stands in the forest. This is just from last fall. And as I said, I just had to go out yesterday <clears throat> because I thought it might be the last storm and get some, some more pictures of them. So big trees. This is another amazing tree in the sense that when Thoreau, he lived on Main Street, as you know, in the Yellow House in the last 10 years of his life, <clears throat> at 50, 50, uh, 255, yeah, Main Street. And he could see the, um, uh, the depot, the train station, and he saw a, a train carrying a hundred foot pine stripped of its bark through the town. And it amazed him. You know, he said, that, you know, a hundred foot pine. He said, you know, Concord is nothing, is nothing the likes of that, you know, where all of our great trees are gone. And so to him, a hundred foot pine was extraordinary. Well, not only has the forest returned as, as, as thorough forecast, as we'll see, but the great trees have come back. And <clears throat> until a few, until recently, the tallest what tree in, in the Concord was a 130-foot white pine in the town forest. Um, and <clears throat> however, in March of, let's see, last year, some colleagues of mine in the Native Tree Society found and documented this white pine in Lincoln, just below the line, only about a mile from Walden Pond. It's 150 feet and two inches, and so it's the tallest white pine in eastern Massachusetts uh, measured with a tape drop and laser. So it's absolutely precise. And there it is, a 
less than a mile from Walden Pond. Now, but Thoreau also loved smaller common trees as well as smaller common trees and the most ordinary things about them. Rotting logs and dead leaves fascinated him. Pitch pine cones, very beautiful, he wrote November 9, 1851. Not only the fresh leather colored ones, but especially the dead gray ones. No detail was too small for his eye. Even a knot in a barn board could catch his eye and cheer him with the thought that the board that's now squared off and nailed together in a barn once grew free and curvy in the forest. Lichen were magical to him. Ah, the beauty of lichens with their scalloped leaves, the crinkled edge, he exclaimed. I could study a single piece of bark for hours, how they flourish. Thoreau took apart pine cones to see how the beautiful silken membrane that encased the seeds eventually became, becomes a wing to bear them aloft. And in this, this is a plate from North American Silva by Andre Michaud. <clears throat> it's a famous book. It's the first survey of forests in North America with these gorgeous, 150 gorgeous plates like this. And the scales, uh, the seeds are at the base of these scales. This is a female seed-bearing pine cone. And at that base where the seed is, it's encased in this um, light membrane that feeds the seed. But then when it's time for the seed to be released, it becomes kind of like a parachute that helps the seed float. And uh, so Thoreau was astounded to discover all this from this close observation, all right? Uh, but this was more than mere observation to Thoreau. It was an act of attention a form of contemplation. The eye, he wrote, has many qualities which belong to God more than to man. Now Thoreau was especially exuberant about trees in winter, a passion that I share with him. The rest of the year, uh, he, made, he made the same, he lived of course in Concord most of his life, he did all of his life while he traveled to Cape Cod, Maine, whatnot, he always came back to Concord. And so he had to work to make this landscape look new or different to him through sheer force of imagination. But the snows of winter did it for him, setting off the dark forms of the trees against the white and disclosing them anew. Uh, here are four images of uh, shadows of trees that I, that I took last, uh, last April, one of the last storms. <clears throat> and Thoreau writes, even the shadows that trees cast in winter are, quote, more distinct than at any time else. Not dark masses merely, but finely reticulated. And here we see the track of perhaps a fox or something. Uh, <clears throat> now, Frost, Thoreau wrote, whoops, wait, one more shadow. I call this the shadow tree, it's in my book. Um, opposite, <clears throat> it's on Liberty Street, or actually, uh, yeah, it's on Liberty, right across from Buttrick's Mansion. It's an oak that I just happened to be passing one winter morning and saw this wonderful sight. Now Frost, Thoreau wrote, can cover the fields uh, and woods with a sparkling ice armor and hang the grasses, quote, with innumerable diamond pendants that jingle merrily when brushed by the foot of the traveler, turning a winter walk into the wreck of jewels and the crash of gems. Don't you love it? What an, an amazing writer he was. Thoreau described how snow reveals the trees in 1860. A snowstorm which began in, in the night is now three or four inches deep. I see how the trees, especially apple trees, are suddenly relieved against the snow, black on white, every twig as distinct as if it were a pen and ink drawing the size of nature. The snow being spread for a background, each apple tree is distinctly outlined against it. It is a moist snow, lodging on trees, leaf, bough, and trunk. Now I share Thoreau's 
fascination, as I said, with uh, trees in winter. I just can't wait to get out after a storm <coughs> as I did yesterday morning. And here's just a small number. This is Monument Street. This is actually the site of the, a famous tree, or yeah, the site of a famous tree, the Proud Elm. But it's sort of opposite, Caddy Corners of Tefen. This is Walden Pond in, in winter, another of my, my lucky point-and-shoot camera shots. Uh, a white pine uh, in that field to the left of Esterbrook Woods. This is, you know, there is so much beauty in, in just the ordinary. This is right near the tennis courts on College Road, just below that uh, Nurse Knack Pond there, you know? This is Haywood's, the path down to Haywood's Meadow after it, last year's blizzard. In February, there was a really, you know, 14, 16 inch blizzard. And uh, so I roamed around and got some photos and I saw some, some action, as it were. Here, a sapling is being clobbered by uh, the wind is shaking down snow on it. So I have a, there are not too many action shots involving trees, so I'm very proud that I got that. Um, now, Thoreau also saw trees with the eye of a poet, and he turned the woods into a font of metaphor and figurative language. He fed his poetic imagination on trees, he said, the same way a moose browses their buds and leaves. He wrote, for years I fed, I browsed on the pine forest edge against the winter horizon. I ranged about like a gray moose, looking at the spiring tops of the trees, and fed my imagination on them. Where was the sap, the fruit, the value of the forest for me, but in that line where it was, re where it was relieved against the sky? That was my woodlot. That was my lot in the woods, the silvery needles of the pine straining the light and all the more poetic for the fact that in <clears throat> the 1850s when Thoreau wrote this, men of means in Concord did actually have a real woodlot, but this was Thoreau's woodlot. Excuse me. Now, speaking of his poetic perception of trees, uh, Thoreau writes that as the scarlet oak leaf dies in autumn, it acquires more color, reflects more light, and spreads more joy uh, as its bodily matter, as he wrote, begins to melt away in the light. Uh, this, is, this is from Autumnal Tints, which is really his magisterial ode to trees. If there's one piece of Thoreau's writing to read, uh, if you're interested in his writing about trees, Autumnal Tints is it. Um, a lot of it is about, the, about ripeness as a form of perfection. And when a leaf obtains, is, is, is ripe, and it obtains a separate existence from the tree uh, and is a prelude to its fall, but then to its rebirth as well. So he writes of the scarlet oak leaf. The leaves lifted higher and higher, putting off some earthiness and cultivating more intimacy with the light each year have at length the least possible amount of earthy matter and the greatest spread and grasp of skyey influences. There they dance, arm in arm with the light, fit partners in those aerial halls. So intimately mingled are they that what with the, their slenderness and their glossy surfaces, you can hardly tell at last what in the dance is leaf and what is light. So beautiful. Thoreau was more of an old salt than most people know, and he frequently used nautical images to depict trees. And I think he did so because he knew he was going to stay in Concord. He loved the ocean. He went to Maine three times, but he went to Cape Cod four times to see the ocean. So he used, he brought the ocean to Concord by describing trees as ships and the Woods is a sea, and it's just, I've, I have a whole chapter on it in my book. He so frequently did this. Um, so a breeze rustling through the trees sounded to him <clears throat> like the surf on a distant shore. 
and in spring, new aspen leaves, when stirred by the wind, made a pattering sound as they struck each other, he wrote, like the rippling of waves. So in January 1859, as Thoreau walked home uh, from Stowe, I believe, uh, to Concord through an oak, young oak wood, uh, some oaks retain their leaves in winter. There's a term for it, but uh, certain, there are certain species of trees, including beech, that uh, retain the dead leaves. Um, and so this, th these oaks did that. And Thoreau heard in January the sharp, dry rustle <clears throat> of the few withered leaves clinging to the branches. And he wrote, this is the voice of the wood now. It would be still and dreary here if it were not for these leaves that hold on. It sounds like the roar of the sea, suggesting how all the land is seacoast to the aerial ocean. It is the sound of the surf, billows of air breaking on the forest like water on sand and rocks. It is remarkable how universal these grand murmurs are, these backgrounds of sound the surf, the wind in the forest, waterfalls, etc., which yet in their origin are essentially one voice, the earth voice, the breathing or snoring of the creature. The earth is our ship, and this is the sound of the wind in her rigging as we sail. Now Thoreau's studies as a naturalist gave him a new lens on trees, in 1851 and 1852, he read John Evelyn's Silva, A Discourse on Forest Trees, one of the very first works of that kind. Uh, an 1846 survey of the forests of Massachusetts by George B. Emerson. And Francois-André Michaud's North American Silva, to which I've already alluded. Uh, first major survey of trees in the New World. Thoreau was really uh, caught up in this and um, he began to identify trees by species in this journal and record data such as the number of stamens in their buds or when they leaf out. Quote, the yellow birch first, then the black, then the white or paper birch. And when they turn color in fall. He also began counting their annual growth rings to learn about their lifespans. But Thoreau's main interest as a naturalist was the mystery of succession how and why one species follows another. He was amazed to discover that even in a white pine grove in which there did not appear to be a single hardwood, there would be, if you looked carefully enough, as often as every five feet, a little oak sapling three to 12 inches high. And this is a, I don't know if you're familiar with Tobin, Tobin Woods uh, near Neshoba Brook School, but this is um, in the woods near there. Uh, so these, these saplings uh, take root, but they are, the pines obstruct the light and they can't grow to full height, so they eventually die, and that's why it remains a pine forest until the pines are cut down and then the opposite occurs. The, uh, and similarly, oaks shelter pine saplings. Those saplings can't grow because of the light being blocked, but when the uh, oaks are cut down, then, it, then the pines shoot up. Now, Thoreau understood this, and other people you know, recognized this pattern, okay? So they knew that this cycle was familiar, but nobody knew why it happened. Uh, Thoreau didn't understand how either succession could occur, uh, how any tree could take root when there, when there were no similar trees nearby. He figured this out by observing how trees disperse their seeds. You know, he literally chased after squirrels, digging up their booties of pine cones and examining the cones and testing their aerodynamic qualities to figure out uh, you know, how these seeds got to different places. And after painstaking observation, he was certain that the wind transmitted the lighter seeds, such as pine seed, and that birds and small animals spread the heavier ones by eating them or carrying them on their fur. Thus trees propagate, he wrote, quote, by the balloon or parachute or, or hook or barbed spear. 
Now, Thoreau was not the first person to suggest that forests naturally regenerate. But he was the first to fully understand the role of wind, animals, and, and unwitting farmers in the propagation of trees. He was the first to document it, and the first to coin the term succession. His obser observations were a major advance in the study of forest dynamics, or should have been. Professional foresters uh, who could not accept the work of a transcendentalist, even a scientific one, ignored it. Really, his, his findings in forestry were really ignored for 50 to 75 years. So Thoreau was really <coughs> buoyed by the success of his lecture, uh, the, the success of the succession of forest trees, a lecture he gave in September 1860 at the Middlesex Cattle Show here in Concord. It was published by Horace Greeley in the New York Tribune and became the most, believe it or not, the most widespread piece that he wrote, the most frequently published and read piece in his lifetime. So he felt a new sense of mission and he busily began collecting data on the life cycle of trees, surveying Concord far Concord's forests, estimating the growth rates of trees by the spaces between their annual growth rings and clawing at roots to expose the clues to the history of a tree. And it was while doing this in early December, December 3, 1860, that he caught a cold that turned into bronchitis and then the tuberculosis from which he never recovered. His death two years later in May 1862 would have been premature in any case because of his age, 44. But the energy and excitement he brought to the study of trees that fall of 1860 makes it all the more tragic. And his life was doubly tragic in that it overlapped almost exactly with the greatest extent of deforestation in New England. By 1850, save for wetlands, inaccessible woodlands, or land just not fit to farm, <coughs> Concord was largely shorn of its trees. Quote, every larger tree which I knew and admired is gradually being culled out and carried to mill, Thoreau wrote in his journal on December 3, 1855. I miss them as surely and with the same feeling that I do the old inhabitants of the village street. But Thoreau felt <clears throat> their loss all the more acutely for knowing the ecological and psychological value of trees. There were rivers of sap flowing from the atmosphere and emptying into the earth, that's a quote, uh, and they were also essential to the human spirit. Quote, what would human life be without forests, those natural cities, he asked. Thoreau's wisdom about trees speaks to us today. Every tree, he wrote in Walking, sends its fibers forth in search of the wild in which lies the preservation of the world. So, so trees seek the wild which will save the planet. The contemporary understanding of trees as carbon sinks uh, that will help reduce global warming makes Thoreau's words seem almost clairvoyant. A century before nurse logs became a popular term in forest ecology, Thoreau said pines were nursemaids to the oak saplings that took root around them. He described trees as fountains of water, and purifiers of the air. He didn't use the word ecology, a German man invented that in 1866, but he saw forests as whole landscapes that transcended public or private boundaries and he urged that they be preserved as such. Now, I don't know if many of you have read The Hidden Life of Trees by the German forester Peter Waldbin, but he proposes that trees communicate but through fungal social networks, uh, exchanging signals through their roots to warn each other of threats and famine and pests and whatever you know, problems there are. So this idea of um, trees communicating could certainly by electrical signals, could not possibly have occurred to Thoreau. But he did intuit that they could communicate. And this is the thing about Thoreau. 
he didn't have all of the science, but he intuited most of what we know about trees today, which is really astonishing. Uh, on March 10, 1859, after sensing that the sap had begun to flow in the woods, he wrote in his journal, quote, such is the genialness of nature that the trees appear to have put out feelers by which our senses apprehend them more tenderly. And despite the relentless cutting of the woods around him, Thoreau foresaw that, one, quote, one day they will be planted and nature reinstated to some extent. And certainly that has become true in spades. Now, despite what I've just told you about Thoreau's work as a naturalist, he did not believe nature could be known reductively, that is, as an object under a microscope. The purely scientific view was too dry, too literal, too narrow. The pursuit of parts obscures the whole. These are <clears throat> scientists examining a giant sequoia sample at the University of Arizona Laboratory of Tree Ring Research in 1950. Quote, Thoreau wrote, the man of science studies nature as a dead language. Thoreau said, now, this doesn't mean that he was against science or the scientific study of trees, merely that science must complement or supplement a broader, wiser, more sympathetic understanding of trees, alert not only to the quantitative facts, but to the message or story or mystery that they present. Thoreau wanted to know not only what trees were, but also what they meant, what they signified. He saw them as expressions of universal laws and spiritual truths. And he wrote about them both as natural fact and as parable. He saw the leaf in particular as an ideal form, a permanent template, he said, found everywhere in nature, from the wings of birds to the antlers of the moose, bird feathers, the human hand, and even fissures in the ice. And this past uh, January, we had, remember the very long cold spell we had right after Christmas? Uh, Walden Pond was frozen over, and I walked on it one day and saw these fissures that, by God, are like trees. And <clears throat> a fallen tree, Thoreau wrote, teaches us that how we live determines the kind of spiritual nutrients we will leave behind. Nature, he wrote, teaches that the passing away of one life is the making of room for another. The oak dies down to the ground, leaving within its rind a, a strong and fruitful mold, which will impart a vigorous life to an infant forest. The pine leaves a sandy and sterile soil. So this constant abrasion and decay makes the soil of my future growth. As I live now, so shall I reap. If I grow pines and birches, my virgin mold will not sustain the oak, but pines or weeds and brambles will constitute my second growth. Now this is a marvelous insight, right? That appropriate to anyone in this room, my age, your age. What's so astonishing about Thoreau is that he, this is the third entry in his journal he began at age 20 in 1837. I mean, just his extraordinary depth and wisdom, even at the age, tender age of 20. Well, finally, um, <clears throat> trees were Thoreau's spiritual companions. And I can't go into it here, but uh, take my word for it that despite his harsh attacks on churches, Thoreau was, in fact, religious to the bone. And there were certain qualities of trees that brought out this religiosity in him. <clears throat> they were spires, he said, that lifted his vision to heaven. Now just what that word meant to him is unclear, but he used heaven all the time, uh, very often in any case, at least in all of its forms, heaven, heavenly, heavens, 48 times in uh, Walden and 11 times just in the chapter economy. Uh, he continually linked trees and heaven. <clears throat> 
By fall, an industrious red maple has grown nearer heaven than it was in the spring. Elms, quote, take a firmer hold on earth that they may rise higher into the heavens. Loggers, he wrote, felled a majestic pine that for two centuries had been rising by slow stages into the heavens. He writes a prayer on a leaf, and the bough springs up the scrawl to heaven. An oak sapling is driven back to earth again 20 times as often as it aspires to the heavens. Now Thoreau preferred not to define what he meant by this. All that mattered to him was the experience of the sacred in nature, and trees often led him to it. They were his shrines and burning bushes. The forest was his cathedral. It spires inspired him more than the whitewashed village steeple. Alone in a distant wood, Thoreau got, quote, what others get from church going, close quote. Quote, when I would recreate myself, he wrote in his essay, Walking, I seek the darkest wood, the thickest and most interminable swamp, and I enter it as a sacred place, a sanctum sanctorum, a holy of holies. Now, if Thoreau sensed the divine in nature, and he did, he did not pre pretend or represent that he understood it. Uh, it was a mystery, and uh, he writes of this when he's after walking in a snowy uh, pine forest one January. Uh, he writes, you glance up the paths, uh, <clears throat> you glance up the paths closely embowered by bent trees as through the side aisles of a cathedral and expect to hear a choir chanting from their depths. You are never so far in them as they are far before you. Their secret is where you are not, and where your feet can never carry you. Thoreau wrote about the spirituality of trees most forthrightly and beautifully uh, in the Maine woods. He begins by noting the uses to which pine trees are commonly put. I have been to the lumberyard and the carpenter shop and the tannery and the lamp black factory, and the turpentine clearing. But when at length I saw the tops of the pines waving and reflecting the light at a distance high over all the rest of the forest, I realized that the former were not the highest use of the pine. It is not their bones or hide or tallow that I love most. It is the living spirit of the tree its spirit of turpentine with which I sympathize and which heals my cuts. It is immortal as I am and perchance will go to as high a heaven there to tower above me still. Well, I'm close with a uh, image of uh, Thoreau's grave at Sleepy Hollow, uh, which I'm gonna just step away for one minute. Um, the Thoreau family, uh, Graves are right about here. Uh, and whether or not um, these pines are immortal, I can't say, but it was a great pleasure on that snowy day to see them towering above him still. Thank you very much. I would be delighted to take any questions if people have them. Sure. Yeah, we have a question there. Um, by the way, I've mentioned um, my, I have an interest in thorough in religion, and um, <clears throat> I have a chapter in my book on it. And the Concord Saunter has published an article of mine about Thoreau's religion. Uh, in the current issue, and they sent me five copies, which I don't need even one is fine. So there's two, two copies, whoever would like them. Uh, it's just, just a new Concord Center. If you're a member of the Thoreau Society, you already get it, but um, I will leave them here, and whoever's enterprising can, can take them. Um, so there was a question, yes. Yeah. 
Oh, what a wonderful um, talk. I Thank you. I love and I love trees, and the combination was just terrific. And this is a little bit maybe off the subject, but I've always wondered, I look out my window, down over the patio, and I don't know what kind of a hardwood tree it is, but its branches go like this, they go like that, they go all over the place. Do you know what it is <laughs> that makes a tree well, put a branch yeah. where they put it? Right. <laughs> well, there's... Uh, Thoreau referred to a, um, a, a, an oak-type elm, which is actually a legitimate kind of uh, elm that um, was like the, 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 the great elm on Boston Common and the Pratt elm in Concord that he wrote about with very angular arms that went kind of in all directions. They weren't va Most elms are vase-like, have this very you know, gentle, curving you know, motion, but these el oak-type elms are all over the place. Um, so that may be what it was. There's probably a more scientific term. I was surprised to see uh, a, a reference by an arborist to that term, oak type elm, but that's what he wrote. And uh, do I have a picture of one? Um, uh, not perhaps in this PowerPoint, but um, there's a marvelous Herbert Wendell Gleason photograph of the Pratt elm that you could find through the Concord Public Library. And if your tree looks like that, then it's an oak type elm. But is it, is it the um, tree that makes them that way, or is it weather, or what? I think it's God. I, I have no idea. I mean, it would be, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, way the tree is, is programmed to grow. I don't know how else. I guess, well, no, I should say that, you know, that's an interesting point. Trees um, lean toward the light, and branches will grow in, a, in the direction of light, uh, so that would be one factor, but then that may not explain. Uh, I'm at a great disadvantage not knowing your tree. <laughs> okay. Well, show me a picture sometime. Anyone else? At one point, you mentioned that there was considerable clearing of trees in this area. Yes. But was that for the mills or for trains? That was for farming um, <clears throat> initially, and then you know the trains sort of added to it. The train came to Concord in 1844, uh, and um, our esteemed uh, town sage Ralph Waldo Emerson was a big investor in the railroads. Uh, and they, they, you know, cut quite a bit of Walden Woods for that. But the initial clearing, you know, was, was to farm. And uh, most of Concord was, was farmland until the, you know, early 18th century when it became industrial. Um, but some, there, you know, you read estimates that all but 10%, that 90% of the land was cleared. I, I find that hard to believe, partly because Thoreau writes so often about trees and describes, you know, the pockets where they are that it, it seems it has to be more than 10%. So I'm always a little dubious, but I would say that Concord was no doubt 75 to 80% cleared of trees uh, because of you know the land was to be used for farming. And that is why about 10 years ago, the, the uh, um, Minuteman Historical National, National Historical Park cut down all the trees. And which is, does anyone remember that? They, you know, it was a very bold decision and um, but they wanted to recreate the landscape as it was, which was pretty treeless. I have a follow-up sure. question, and that is... That's just one dollar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did, uh, at, his, at that age, did that, was that premature for, for people like Thoreau to be thinking in terms of preserving land? Absolutely. Was that even aside, or did he participate in that? Or what, was there any he, sequitur to his being concerned yes. about he was not an agitator <clears throat> for the preservation of trees in the sense that he didn't actively, you know, lobby or whatever to make that happen. But everyone who did after him cited Thoreau as an inspiration. Most prominently John Muir, who convinced Teddy Roosevelt to create the national park system. And Muir cited Thoreau as his uh, guru. And uh, I think E.O. Wilson, e. Wilson has called Thoreau the patron saint of the environmental movement. So he articulated the ethic, the reason why we need to save trees, and then other people have gone out and done it. That's an interesting answer. 
And you mentioned measuring the white pine by Walden Pond mm -hmm. uh, through tape drop and laser. Technology. Yes. Can you explain um, how sure. you can measure it sure. precisely? Sure. Sure. I'll. I'll, I'll Yes, I mean, I, when you say can you explain, I get a little nervous because the, la the laser rangefinder, all I know is that there is a device called a laser rangefinder, which through shooting lines uh, can calculate distances to within tenths of an inch. And, and I know a gentleman who uses that. But because these people in the Native Tree Society, founded by Bob Leverett, are, are, are mad about precision, they will get into arguments about whether a tree is 151 feet in one inch or three inch. And so to settle that, the absolute drop dead way to find out how tall a tree is, is to climb to the tippy top and drop a tape down. And you can't believe it, but they do that. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is, you know. Um, and that, yeah, so this, the, the, the tree. dangerous. It is, it is dangerous. Uh, and that, um, that, pine I showed you is in, it's, it's just off Fairhaven Bay, the lower end of Fairhaven Bay, sort of um, between Mount Misery and Walden Pond. But how astonishing that the tallest tree would be, would be right there. Well, if there are no other questions, I thank you very much. You are a wonderful audience to speak to. Thank you. You're most welcome.